Welcome back to Girls on Deck. Today I am joined by Abby Bass to talk some NFL. How are you, Abby? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good and excited to talk some football this week. It's been an exciting week in football and not for Dak Prescott, unfortunately. That was absolutely devastating I, for the Cowboys. I feel horrible for Dak Prescott and horrible for the Cowboys. And I just send my sincere um, wishes for to get well soon, Dak Prescott. Um, so going into the Miami Dolphins and 49ers game that was happening last Sunday, the Miami Dolphins shocked probably every football fan and won. Um, it was a complete disaster on the 49ers part and a complete miracle on the Miami Dolphins specifically Ryan Fitzpatrick who threw for 350 yards and scored three touchdowns that game I mean Ryan Fitzpatrick is someone who he said of himself in an article recently where he feels he's an emotional like or a roller coaster in his performances in games and I think I can agree with that there's been so many times where we needed him where he's let us down or sorry where the Miami Dolphins <laughs> needed him I'm a Miami Dolphins fan <laughs> needed him and um they he let them down and I think this is one of those things where he's like okay this is this is Ryan Fitzpatrick this is who he is as a player and I think he really showed you know, what he is capable of even at his older age. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think many people were really expecting the Miami Dolphins to win by that much. And I don't think people were expecting the 49ers to lose by that much. No. So it was it was really Ryan Fitzpatrick game. He threw yes. for 350 yards and three touchdowns. Meanwhile, Jimmy Garoppolo threw two interceptions in the first half. And that's why um, he got benched. And then so he also had the lowest QBR game by any quarterback yet this season. So now the 49ers Niners are 0 3 at home and they're fourth in the NFC West. So it's going to be really hard for the 49ers to recover after that game. Exactly. And I might add that it's kind of embarrassing considering they almost won the Super Bowl and they have now two consecutive losses. I mean, this is just not, you know, they have a lot of in and injuries granted. You know, they don't have Nick Bosa, they don't have other people, but. It's not, you know, that for a team that made it so far last year, this isn't how you should be doing the following season. This is not the way you should be performing, and I think it's going to greatly hurt them. Yeah, I think they let a lot of the 49ers fans down. I mean, Jimmy yes. Garoppolo, we expected him to be great, as he was. I mean, he got in the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. and then, you know, he just let Ryan Fitzpatrick shine. So it was, yeah. it was pretty disappointing. I think that something to note, too, I feel like that's a weakness with Jimmy Garoppolo is that he – cracks under pressure a lot mm -hmm. he you saw it in the Super Bowl they were winning and then the fourth quarter the um Chiefs came back and won it all so it's something that the 49ers need to work with him or you know figure something out because it's if they want to win again they're you know they're not going to be able to do it like that especially yeah especially like them being 0-3 at home that's that's really mm -hmm. bad that's something like you should be winning your home games exactly at least, at least. <laughs> All right, now going into another exciting game was the Steelers versus Eagles. The Steelers won 38-29. to Now, this game was extra exciting because rookie wide receiver Chase Claypool became the first Steelers rookie to make four touchdowns in one game and the first to do it at all the first to do it at all since 1968. Yeah, that was a really, really impressive performance by the Steelers. You know, the Eagles haven't been doing great this season, but again, I don't think the Steelers really were expected to shine as much as they did yesterday. And it was it's safe to say that Chase Claypool was the star of the game yesterday. Yes. Four touchdowns in his rookie season, so it's really impressive what he's doing for that team. Absolutely, and given that, you know, he's taking over for the injured wide receiver, um, Johnson, Don Deontay Johnson. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, this is his, this was his opportunity to start out and make a name for himself. And I think he did that, you know, he, he broke a record and he's not supposed to be starting. So I think the Steelers, like, it looks good for the future of the Steelers. Yeah, it definitely looks good for them. And I mean, when you have Carson Wentz throwing two interceptions, you know, yeah. that's, it's, it's tough if you're an Eagles fan and you're hoping that somehow they're going to come back and have a great season like they did a couple of years ago. But it just doesn't look likely. I mean, now the Steelers are undefeated and mm -hmm. they're the only undefeated team in the AFC North. So I think, you know, looking ahead, the Steelers really, you know, they're going to have a great season going forward, I think. Yeah, I'm excited to see how the Steelers perform. You know, I think they're a team that has been working on getting to a playoff a great playoff run so I think they're they're on their way there for sure yeah I mean it's going to be really interesting to see if the Steelers can keep up that momentum against some of these really great teams like the um like the Seahawks and the Packers you know that's some tough competition they have now absolutely now going into the Giants Cowboys game where Dak Prescott 
brutally hurt himself yesterday. Um, the Cowboys still prevailed 37-34. to 34. It was a close game. It was a lot of back and forth. Um, Andy Dalton did take in when after Dak Prescott hurt himself in the third quarter, and they still ended up winning. So I think that's something to show for Andy Dalton and Cowboys fan, maybe give them a little faith for the season. Yeah, I mean, that game was really crazy because we didn't really know who was going to win. I mean, Giants had the lead 14-3 to against the Cowboys in the first quarter, and then Dallas took the lead, and then it was back and forth the mm-hmm. whole time. And so – you know, when Dak Prescott got injured in the third quarter, you know, it seemed like that was it. That You know, that was it. They couldn't rebound from that. But then they ended up scoring the winning field goal and ended up taking the win against the Giants. So Cowboys were able to rebound from that. And, you know, what happened to Dak Prescott was, was just Horrible. devastating. I mean, that injury was gruesome. So, was I mean. Sobbing, crying, like carting off the field. And I couldn't blame him. I mean, I said, do you see the video of what mm-hmm. it looked? I was like. I would be screaming like that just looked like the worst pain in the world. And Mm -hmm. um, he did go through surgery on Sunday night and it was successful, thankfully. But, you know, odds are he probably won't be coming back this season, but hopefully he can recover and get prepared to come back next season. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, Mm -hmm. Dak Prescott's, you know, it's hard to see any player get injured, Mm -hmm. but Dak Prescott's like the star for Dallas. So it was especially hard. Yeah, I think that's something that in sports, that's where like who your team is, it goes away for a second because you just feel bad for the player. You know, you just want them to feel better and nothing like that. You never want a career ending, ending injury on anyone. You never wish that. So um, prayers for Dak Prescott for sure. And I think this is now time for Andy Dalton to shine, mm-hmm. to prove himself. You know, with the Bengals, he didn't have much success. That A lot of people doubt him as a quarterback, and I think this is his chance to really prove himself as a strong quarterback. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the Cowboys, they do have two wins so far, but those wins were against the Giants and the Falcons, and they barely won those yeah. games. So their offense is not looking strong not having Dak Prescott, that's going to be really tough for the Cowboys to recover. And to lose against a team like the Giants and the Falcons, I mean, they're not – they're at the bottom. Like, yeah, it's yeah. It's not – or to win against it, uh, them, sorry, it's – they're at the bottom. So you should be winning it by a landslide. And the fact that it was close, I mean – yeah, that's a little scary as if you're a Cowboys fan, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to have to see if the Cowboys can bounce back from that. And I mean, yeah, if you can barely win against the Giants and the Falcons, that's I don't know. It's not looking good for yeah. you. So <laughs> hopefully the Cowboys can pull it out this season. and We'll see what they can do without Dak Prescott. Mm-hmm. Now, going into the Bears and the Buccaneers on Thursday night, it was 20 to 19 Bears. I mean, talk about a close game, 20 to 19. I, what are your thoughts on the game? You know, it kind of reminds me of the Atlanta Falcons game when the Bears won just barely against mm-hmm. the Falcons. Not because, you know, I don't feel it's because the Bears um, are really the stronger team. I really think it was just because the Falcons just have been the Falcons this yeah, year. Been. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was interesting because the Bucks had a 13 to nothing lead. And yeah. then all of a sudden, you know, we kind of see the Bucks offense start to go downhill. And then we start to see the Chicago Bears start to, you know, shine a little bit. So it just proves that, you know, throwing in Tom Brady isn't always the lifesaver yeah. for a team. And it wasn't in that game. I mean, he had a mental little mess up when he thought it yeah. was the third down on the final offensive play for the Bucks, And it was the fourth down. I'm like, like, everyone's like, what happened? Are you yeah. like, are you okay? What's happening? Um, so I definitely think, you know, like, Buck fan, don't get too cocky when <laughs> you have Tom Brady because clearly it's not working for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as another thing was that Nick Foles was pretty consistent the entire game for them, which is what the Bears needed or else the Bucks would have won. Um, he only threw for one intercept, one interception, and it wasn't necessarily his fault. Mm-hmm. Um, he threw for 243 yards the entire game. So, you know, he, he made his mark. He, he did what the Bears needed him to do to win in the end. Yeah, I think so, too. And, you know, going into that game when Tampa Bay had 11 penalties that cost them so many yards, and it's just like they, they kind of blew it. And then yes. the Bears were able to step up and win the game by one. Just yeah. crazy. Yes, and that's, that's the exciting thing. I love a close game. It makes it on your, on your feet the whole time. <laughs> well, that's all for segment one. And when we come back, we'll be discussing the top rookies of the season. So stay tuned. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying today's episode on Hitting the Field Network. On my show, Take Me Out to the Podcast, we're bringing you the latest in MLB news and some incredible interviews with some incredible people, including Bobby from Out of Here Baseball, Bailey from Foolish Baseball, Dawson Wright, Alec Palmer from Momentum, and so many more. Be sure to tune in to Take Me Out to the Podcast every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on HTFN.
And we're back to talk some top rookies of this season so far. And let's start out with the number one draft pick from 2020, Joe Burrow. (laughs) He's been crucial for that Bengals Mm -hmm. team. I mean, number one draft pick, how can you not make an impact on a team? He has thrown for over 1,100 yards this season and six touchdowns so far. And, you know, in the games that he lost against the Chargers and the Browns, they were still really close games. Mm -hmm. Um, He's been performing really well even in those losses. And when they won against the Jaguars, he actually threw for 300 yards and one touchdown. So for a rookie, he's doing really well so far. Absolutely. And that's something that the Bengals needed. Again, Andy Dalton just was not was not working for them and they needed a strong quarterback to fill that position and a lot of people when Joe Burrow went number one they didn't they didn't have faith in him because he had that all-star season but it was just one season basically they were going off of so Mm -hmm. it with LSU and so people doubted his performance to be able to carry that into the NFL and I think he's proving himself that he can last in the NFL and he he's a great decision maker when he's on the field I mean he knows the field well so it's just I think he's going to be what the Bengals need. Yeah, I mean, even even though the Bengals are one and three and one, you know they don't have a great record. But it's so hard, you know, going from yeah. LSU to the NFL. It's it's not even comparable. So I think Joe Burrow is doing really well so far. Absolutely. Again, like you like you said, like it's a they're rookies, so you know you have to give them their their chance to prove themselves. And I think you know it's going to be a slow build for the Bengals. They're not gonna they're not gonna be Super Bowl champions this year, or maybe even next year. But I think it's good. Uh, if you are a Bengals fan, to see the potential, see where they could go with someone like Joe Burrow. Right. They they definitely need, needed him on that team for yes, sure. So it's absolutely. a good thing that happened. Absolutely. <laughs> Going into another one is defensive end Chase Young from the Washington football team. I mean, he is a great pass, rush, pass rusher, word vomit, um, <laughs> for a team who needed one. And I think he's, again, the Washington football team is something that is a team that needed strong defense, strong players. So I think this is a good fit for them. Yeah, I mean, when you come from Ohio State, you know, you know that you're going to be great, just like Clemson and Alabama and other teams have always, you know, proven themselves to be great. You know, he's had one forced fumble and two and a half sacks this season. Mm -hmm. And then when he won against the Eagles, he had one and a half sacks and one and a half tackles. So he's really you know, important for this Washington team who has struggled so far this season. And so their defensive end is really going to depend on Chase Young. Absolutely. And I think, you know, he's had eight tackles. He's only played three games so far, and he's just already proving to be a strong player, someone that they need, someone that they need to win games. So I think it's awesome for the Washington football team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're already, you know, struggling this season so far, just Mm -hmm. so many reasons. So it's a great thing that they have Chase Young. Yes, absolutely. Another one who's making a name for himself is Justin Jefferson, the wide receiver on the Minnesota Vikings. He's a great route runner, great hands. He caught a low catch from Kirk Cousins in the game on Sunday, which was pretty awesome to watch. Um, So what do you think of him? Well, he also came from LSU, a great team, along with Joe Burrow. Um, He's He's third in the NFL in yards per reception. Um, He's in the top 10 in the NFL in total receiving yards with 348. And when they won against the Texans, he had over 100 receiving yards. So he's somebody that the Minnesota Vikings can really count on. Absolutely. And to be a rookie and be third overall, I mean, that's that's pretty, like, you know, kudos to you because that's hard to do. And so... It's awesome to see that. It's a good asset to the Minnesota Vikings for sure. Yeah, it's another one of those teams who isn't having a great start, but yeah. they have, you know, a star rookie. So, you know, they could turn it around a poten- potentially. It just, you know, depends on how well um, Justin Jefferson performs, I think. So, yes, absolutely. And there's still time. It's still early. <laughs> another young star rookie is CeeDee Lamb, a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys, where they're going to really need him now without Dak Dak Prescott for the rest of the season. So he's honestly a great weapon on a stacked offense for the Cowboys. Yeah, he's one of those rookies who's going to make an impact on the Cowboys. He has 21 receptions and over 300 receiving yards and two touchdowns so far this season. And when they won just barely against the Giants on Sunday, he had eight receptions, um, each averaging over 15 yards per reception for a total of 124 yards. So One of those rookies who, you know, for a team not as bad as, you know, Washington. um, But, you know, he's going to make an impact on this team for sure. Exactly. And, you know, they're a team that's kind of like wishy-washy in the middle almost. You know, it's like where they could do good, they could do bad. It's really not expected of either. But um, he's going to be an asset to them. He has two games with over 100 yards so far. So I think that's something important, something that the Cowboys are going to need. And I think it's awesome. It proves that their pick was a correct one. Yeah, after suffering that, you know, Dak Prescott 
loss. It's going to be really important for every teammate in this Dallas Cowboys team to really step up. Absolutely. And going into another quarterback that's making a name for himself is Justin Herbert. I mean, he's thrown for 930 yards in his first three starts, second most in team history. Yeah, he's one of those um, star rookies that I think is making one of the most impacts on the NFL so far. Mm -hmm. I mean, he already has five touchdowns this season. And, you know, when they when they lost against the Chiefs, it was so close. They went to yes. overtime that game, and then they lost also against the Panthers and the Buccaneers, but those games were so close. Mm -hmm. And I think Justin Herbert is that star that the Chargers need going forward, especially because they play in such a hard division. So exactly. it's time for Justin Herbert to, you know, keep the momentum up. Yes, absolutely. And going off what you said, like one of the most um, difficult divisions is he's in a different position than other rookies where he's going up against – three MVP quarterbacks on Monday night. He went up against um, Drew Brees. I mean, it's something where a rookie hasn't been put in such a position. He's he's proving to stand up to them. You know, he's not getting nervous, not cracking under the pressure. So I think that's awesome for the futures of the LA Chargers. Yeah, absolutely. In that first game against the Chiefs, I mean, he played so well at mm -hmm. home against the defending Super Bowl champions. So we're really impressed with Justin Herbert so far. Absolutely, absolutely. And our last rookie we're going to talk about is the one that won the game for the Steelers, Chase Claypool. He's the wide receiver for the Steelers. And as we said before, he broke history on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, he set the record with four touchdowns for the Steelers. And, you know, we didn't really think that the Steelers were going to shine as much as they did against the Eagles. Eagles, but Chase Claypool is, I think, one of the most impressive rookies that we saw on Sunday. Absolutely. And again, he's taking over for Deontay Johnson, who's injured right now. So this is him proving his spot on the Steelers. This is him proving that he can be a starter and he can carry the team. Absolutely. I mean, what an impressive start he's had so far. Yes. It's awesome. Well, we hope to see the rookies continue to make a name for themselves this season. And when we come back, Kennedy, China, and Crystal will be talking some NBA finals. I have a very special guest, Mr. Mike Golick Jr. Let me tell you, this is one of the nicest guys I have met so far in this industry. So thank you so much for coming and talking to me. I really appreciate it. Hey, listen, smart move. I am not immune to flattery, so buttering me up on the way in is the absolute right way to do this. You're learning already. That was the goal. That was the goal. I had it in my notes. Thank you, Kayla and Abby. That was a really good segment. Um, China was unable to join us today for the meeting, but I'm here with Crystal Tisney. Crystal, how are you? Good, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well myself. The Lakers just won their 17th franchise title last game um, in game six. So just overall, were you surprised that the Lakers won? No, I expected the Lakers to win because Miami was the underdog throughout this whole, the whole playoff. So I just, I don't know, I just felt like the Lakers were destined to win, especially with the year they've had. And then talking about Miami, just being the underdogs, coming in as the five seed and then making it to the Eastern Conference Finals, and then now the finals. Just what do you think that this showed about Miami's team as an organization, just where they have their future going forward? Well, coming in as the fifth seed into the playoffs, I feel like they show that they're a very resilient team and will go after it, even if no one believes in them, they believe in themselves. So I feel like they really pushed themselves this year into making the finals and they didn't do as bad as people <laughs> rejected them to do. So I feel like they definitely exceeded their expectations for this year. And I think that in the future, they'll have many more opportunities to get that championship, to get that ring. Definitely. And then talking about just opportunities they'll have, they have a lot of players that are going into free agency um, this coming year. So yes. what do you think <laughs> that they need to get? Is it a Giannis or do they need, you know, maybe some smaller players with the money that they'll have with their cap space? Who do you think or what do you think that they need to get in order to put them in a position to get back to the finals next season? I think that they still need those role players on the bench to come off and score as um, like they kind of had this year, but they need stronger ones because if they were to get a star per se, um, they would have to give up like a, like hero or Robinson um, to get that star. So it's kind of like you have to weigh the options, which would be better 
to because they're trying to build around Jimmy Butler. So I feel like he said he said in many instances that he feels like this is his home and this is where like this is his fit for him. And it kind of showed that in the playoffs this year, how everybody worked around him and it worked well. Definitely. And then we saw Jimmy Butler had the 40 point triple double in game four and then came back with a 35 point triple double and then kind of fell off in the last game here. But do you think this is where Jimmy Butler has found his home? Do you think that this is where he's going to stay and this is where he's going to grow for the rest of his career? Yes, I believe so. And like I said, in many interviews that he's had, he's expressed how he fits in very well with this team. And he does, he said he feels at home in Miami. And I think he can can provide, if they keep the younger players, I feel like they, he can provide that mentorship and to and grow them in player development so they could become a more contending playoff team and might even win a championship in the next couple of years. Definitely. We're going to see how that one works out. Now, switching over to someone that may or may not have found a home, do you think that Anthony Davis should stay with the Lakers after winning this championship? Yes, I do believe that Anthony Davis should stay with the Lakers just because, like, him and LeBron have such a great relationship on and off the court, as you could see after game six when they were celebrating the, the win. And also, LeBron James provides him AD with, like, mentorship, and he can help him grow in that position that he's trying to grow in. And also, who wouldn't want to stay with a team that could potentially continue to win championships? So I feel like it would be a smart decision for him to stay. Definitely. But do you and I feel like he that, will stay. Do you think that he can build? Because Anthony Davis is constantly talking about building his legacy. Do you think that he can build that legacy while being a counterpart to LeBron? Or does he need to go somewhere else in order to create that bigger name for himself? Um, I feel like he's still a big role in on the Lakers team. I don't think it's just LeBron James. Obviously LeBron is a big part of it, but I feel like AD is, is as well. Cause without LeBron, I feel like, or without AD, I feel like LeBron, it would be harder for him to have won that championship. So I feel like AD is a vital role on this team. And I feel like he should stay. <laughs> I don't see why not. Like Kyrie, for example, Kyrie had left uh, Cleveland to be his own star and we see how that worked out for him so I feel like everybody needs that additional push in a team like you can't do it all on your own definitely and for LeBron being that push now we kind of talk about this is his fourth championship with three different teams fourth MVP finals um, and then he's a 15-time all-star and still playing so do you think that this championship puts LeBron in a position to be one of the Lakers greats, given that he would be up there with Magic, um, Elgin Baylor, James Worthy, and just so many other names? Do you think that that puts him in the Lakers greats? Um, I think he, I mean, LeBron is a great, one of the greatest NBA players in history, but like alone so I feel like yes it does put him with the grades but I feel like he still needs to continue to win more championships at like at the level of Kobe so, to be considered like part of the Lakers grades yes if that makes sense and everyone's been talking about it and I just kind of want to hear your opinion on it do you believe that my that um lebron's four championships that he's won three different teams and of course now still playing um has an opportunity to win more does this make it better than the six championships that michael jordan has won um i feel like it's hard to compare because they're in two different generations but i feel like lebron i'm not i'm, I'm i don't know i'm not going to give a definite answer but i feel like they're both, they both worked hard to win it. And it's just, it's just hard to say who, who's better. Cause they're, they weren't in the same time. Like if they were both at their primes and they played against each other, that'd be one thing, but it's kind of hard to say cause it's a different game nowadays. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a really 
great answer to put because we can't really pinpoint, you know, who's better, what's better. Um, we just kind of have to see, especially because LeBron is still playing. Um, but the last thing that I have is, do the Lakers repeat? Do they come back next season and just dominate? Or do you think this is going to be a different season, seeing how Miami played and just seeing how different components, uh, different teams played, like the Nuggets um, in their finals, in their conference finals run? Do we see the Lakers coming back and coming to the finals and winning again? Or is this going to be a harder season next season? Um, I think next season they definitely have an, a shot of winning or going to the finals and possibly winning the finals. It just depends what happens off season as well. Like there's a lot of free agents and there's a lot of moving parts that could potentially make or break a team. So I just think it really depends what happens this off season and uh, other teams staying healthy as well. Cause the West is pretty strong. So it just all depends. Yeah. And I guess we're just going to have to wait and see whenever they decide to resume the season. But Crystal, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been really great. You had some really good feedback. Um, when we get back, we're going to have Abby and Kayla give their final thoughts. Stay tuned. Things gonna change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance, man, you know what's the deal. Trying to find a kid, I'm in a field doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you yeah, ain't never keep it real. The rings in my hand, I'm a boy to the max. When I hang it up, they gon' have to give me plaques. Step up in the building and I only bring the facts. When I make a highlight, they gon' replay, run it back, okay? Always locked in, now I got time to lax. Saying he the best, he could take a lap. Batted 1,000 when you check the stats. Boy, is you ready? You ain't gotta ask. And we're back with our final segment of today, doing a little bit of a mock draft for the future 2021 draft. Now, there's a lot of different variations of rankings right now, um, mm -hmm. but according to NFL.com, the bottom teams will be the Jets, the Giants, the Washington football team, the Jaguars, and the Broncos. So starting off with the Jets, I have to say they can't pass up on Trevor Lawrence. I mean, Sam Darnold has not been consistent for them. He's continually let them down. He saw a ghost on the field one time, for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> so I think it'd be silly for the Jets to pass up on Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, when you look at the Jets and the Giants, so the two New York teams that are winless this season, you know, the Giants have Daniel Jones, the Jets have Sam Darnold, so, and they're both young, they're both new quarterbacks for these teams, and, you know, the Jets and the Giants are really struggling, they haven't had a win this season, yeah. so, you know, when, when we talk about Trevor Lawrence going to be, you know, huge in the in the draft, and Absolutely. if, if there was a draft right now, you know, I would think that maybe the Jaguars would want Trevor Lawrence because all three of their quarterbacks that they have right now came from third round and sixth round picks. So you would think maybe, you know, since the Jaguars are third in the AFC South, that maybe they would want a first round draft pick like Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I could definitely agree with that. I just don't know that the Jets will let them have that, you know, right. because it, and again, it, you know, it's ever changing. It, the Jaguars could be number one by the end of the season. So you never know. But as of right now, I don't see the Jets passing up on it. Um, and if they did, I'd see them like trading a pick maybe with the Jaguars. That could mm -hmm. be a possibility. Um, but either way, I think, you know, the Jaguars should be looking to maybe get another quarterback. You know, Gardner Minshaw hasn't been performing as well as they expected him to. So I think that's something that they could be looking for. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be really – these quarterbacks, you know, we're talking about um, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and even Trey Lance. You know, these are going to be quarterbacks that mm -hmm. teams want, especially these winless teams like the Jets, the Giants, and including the Atlanta Falcons. So, you know, if there were going to be a draft right now, it's, inter it's interesting to see, you know, which players, which uh, teams that they would want. So Absolutely. And I think, you know, Justin Fields from Ohio State, I think – that may be the Washington football team if they're if they're as it says now third in the draft I think that's something that definitely that they will definitely pick up on is because they need a strong quarterback you know they need they need offense they need that so I think it'd be again silly of them to pass up on Justin Fields if they're given the opportunity yeah as far as Washington goes I think maybe they would want to keep their eye out on Trey Lance he's the quarterback for North Dakota State because currently Washington has two quarterbacks who are first round draft picks Dwayne Haskins and Alex Smith so I think either a Justin Fields or a Trey Lance is something or somebody that um, Washington would look out for yeah and then Alex Smith had just come back from 
a brutal injury. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, if he can perform for them and it comes to the draft and he's what they need, maybe they're going to look for another position. Yeah. You know, it depends. It really has to see how the season goes out for them. And then for the Giants, I'd say they take Micah Parsons, linebacker from Penn State. I think they need that um, a stronger defense. They're in desperate need of it, and they would greatly benefit from a player like Parsons. Yeah, that's absolutely true because the Giants are really struggling right now, and it's not like you can just draft another quarterback and then save your team. You need other people like Mm -hmm. your wide receivers, your running backs in order to help your offense. So that would be – yeah, the Giants would really benefit from that. Yeah, I think maybe later in the draft, you know, you pick up another quarterback or something, but I think you really need – to build the rest of the team in the beginning. And I think, you know, picking up someone like Micah Parsons is, is just, would be a great, a great thing. Absolutely. Now the Jaguars, we talked about it a little bit, but let's say they don't pick a quarterback. I say that they pick Caleb Farley, cornerback from Virginia Tech. What do you think? You know, that would be great for the Jaguars. They're, you know, one in four, third mm-hmm. in the AFC South. And, you know, all three quarterbacks again are from the third and sixth round pick. So it's, you know, you need – other people besides you know your quarterbacks to save your team so you know again I would think that the Jaguars might want you know Trevor Lawrence I think that's one of those circumstances Mm -hmm. where Trevor Lawrence really could help the Jaguars because we really don't see the Jaguars as really playoff contenders now Um, but it would be really interesting to see you know which players uh, that, that the Jaguars would pick absolutely and if they did go with Caleb Farley cornerback It'd be a great addition, I think, because they have C.J. Henderson, who they picked up first round last year, and that's going to be a nightmare. You have two number one picks going against any wide receiver. I mean, that's going to be a really strong asset to have going against any team. Yeah, and the Jaguars can use any help that they can get at this point. Yeah, so. for real. Yeah. <laughs> now, if standings are the way they are now, um, the Broncos will take the fifth pick, and I think this is where they will take Penny Sewell, um, offensive tackle from Oregon. I mean, they need offense. Because Drew Locke has not proven to be a strong quarterback yet. He's someone that needs some help, needs some work. I don't know that they take a new quarterback in the first round because I think he still has time to prove himself. But um, I definitely think he needs a good offense lined up around him. Yeah, I agree with that. And if they were going to take a quarterback, I would go with Justin Fields from Ohio State because the Broncos are 1-3. and three. They're third in the AFC West, and they're um, Blake Bortles, who they drafted, is Denver's only first-round draft pick. So if they were going to go with a quarterback, I would say Justin Fields, but they need they need offense right now. They really Absolutely, need help. Absolutely, yes. And I don't know that they'll get even the chance to get someone like Justin Fields or Trevor Lawrence. So we'll see. Again, it all depends – where the draft is when it comes down to actually existing (laughs) next season or next year so um we'll see how these teams do we'll see who they pick up again it's ever changing it could be a completely different list by the end of the season but make sure to follow us on social media like our pictures like our videos um and we'll be back next week with an all-new episode thank you